For 39 years, Christmas has haunted the Martinko family. 18-year-old Michelle Martinko was brutally murdered six days before Christmas. Her family had to endure decades of heartache, hoping that one day they'll have the answers to the horrific murder of their beautiful girl. They lost all hope after a lengthy investigation failed to produce any leads, and the case remained unsolved for 39 years. DNA was first used in criminal investigations in 1986. Prior to that, cases were solved with good old-fashioned police work and intuition. Sometimes a suspect would slip through the investigative cracks and get away with their crime. Such was the case for Michelle Martinko's murderer. However, thanks to the bravery and strength of the victim and a woman who was curious about her family, the case was solved and closure was provided to the open wounds of the Martinko family. Six days before Christmas in 2018, Michelle's killer was finally arrested on the 39th anniversary of her murder. This is the story of Michelle Martinko. It was six days before Christmas in 1979. Michelle Martinko, a high school student from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, went to the mall intending to purchase a coat. The young girl walked to the family car that she had left in the dark corner of the parking lot after leaving the mall. In order to warm up the engine, she turned it on and sat there for a moment. This was the moment when someone opened the door, pushed her over and stabbed her 29 times. Michelle bled to death in the car after one of the stab wounds penetrated the aorta of her body. You're about to hear the brutality of the murder in the prosecutor's opening statement. Received numerous stab wounds. A stab wound that penetrated her right lung and two that penetrated her left lung. A wound identified as the fatal wound that penetrated her sternum and rib cage and pierced her aorta just above her heart. From his testimony, you'll also learn that she sustained a three to three and a half inch bruise on her head that also had corresponding internal bleeding. The evidence will show she lost one third of her blood capacity and bled to death. From his testimony, you'll hear evidence that based upon the trajectory of her wounds, the assailant was facing her at the time of the attack. That her wounds were consistent with being pushed down on her back and attacked from the front. And that the assailant was on top of her, coming down on her. You'll hear that the amount of force required to inflict these injuries was significant. From his testimony, you'll learn that there was evidence of a struggle and that Michelle sustained numerous defensive wounds to her hands. The evidence will show this was a brutal attack. As a young girl, Michelle loved wearing dresses and styling her blonde hair in the style of American actress Farrah Fawcett. According to her family, she was kind, sweet, funny, pretty and smart. In addition to being involved in the choir at school, she was passionate about interior design. The older sister of Michelle, Janelle Stonebreaker, recalls that before Michelle was born, her mother, Jeanette, suffered five miscarriages. It was at the age of 44 that Jeanette gave birth to Michelle, who became known as the quote-unquote miracle child. She was sort of our miracle baby because my mother was 44 when she had my sister. She was just the world and all to us. And as a child, she was the happiest little girl you'd ever want to meet. At the age of 12, Michelle was diagnosed with scoliosis, a spine disorder requiring her to wear a brace for two years to straighten her spine. As soon as the brace was removed, she began receiving a great deal of attention from the boys. Andy Seidel was one of those young men. Andy and Michelle Seidel separated after dating for two years. It was Michelle who broke up with Andy. She dated another boy named Mike Myrick a few months later, but Andy wasn't ready for it. It was noted by Janelle's husband John that after they broke up he wanted to know her every move, who she was dating and why she was dating that particular person. On December 19, 1979, Michelle attended a banquet held at the Sheridan Inn in Cedar Rapids in honour of the Kennedy Concert Choir. She wore a black dress and black scarf, black tights and heels and a waist-length white and brown rabbit fur jacket, and she carried a brown leather purse. 
After the event, she asked Hansen, her friend and teammate from the Twirling Squad, if she would like to join her on a shopping excursion to the newly opened Westdale Moor where Michelle worked. Her friend declined, and so Michelle went alone. Once she got to the moor, she browsed the stores and bumped into a few of her classmates, as well as Andy. She was last seen at 8 or 9pm in front of a jewellery store at the moor. Michelle never came home that night. When Michelle didn't arrive home, her family started to worry. Michelle's friend, Jane Hansen, remembers getting a call from Michelle's mother, Jeanette, who sounded frantic. At 2am, Michelle's father reported her missing. Police and her father began searching for her. An officer discovered the Martinko family's 1972 Buick Electra near the J.C. Penney store in the parking lot of the moor at 4am. Michelle was found collapsed over the passenger seat and stabbed to death. The attack was vicious. Michelle had been stabbed 29 times in her face, neck and chest. There were defensive wounds on her hands, indicating that she had fought back against her attacker. Police determined from the lack of blood outside the car that Michelle had been killed while in the car, and the medical examiner later estimated that she had died between 8 and 10 p.m. The murder weapon, although never found, was sharp-pointed, but it could not be determined if it was a knife. No fingerprints were left, which led the police to think the killer wore gloves. The police determined that Michelle wasn't robbed based on cash found in her purse. It seemed like a personal attack, an attack of jealousy. The medical examiner determined she wasn't sexually assaulted because she was fully dressed. Based on the number and location of stab wounds, particularly to her face, police said the killing was personal in nature. Michelle's friend Hansen carried a sense of guilt because she didn't join her friend at the moor that night. Every teenager at that time was scared. That sort of violent crime had never been seen at Cedar Rapids before. Within days of Michelle's murder, police received more than 200 phone calls and letters from people who wanted to help. Andy was questioned by the police but his mother provided an alibi for him. She said he was home from the mall by the time Michelle was murdered. Many people, including Michelle's family and friends, expected Andy to be charged, but he never was. He left Cedar Rapids to join the Navy. No one was charged with the murder. Numerous individuals were also interviewed by the police, and several of them were cleared of suspicion following a polygraph examination. Rumours began to spread about the crime. Before Michelle's death, some speculated that she had received harassing phone calls, but the police said they did not believe so. Police denied another rumour that a second stabbing occurred in the following days and that they were keeping it a secret. There was controversy five months after the murder. A woman drove by the parking lot of the moor on December 20 in the early hours and gave information. Seeing her daughter working at the moor and having car trouble, she looked into the parking lot as she drove by. There were two cars in the lot one of which was Michelle's, as well as a man standing next to the open door of Michelle's car. She was unsure if her information would be of any use because the murder occurred sometime between 10pm and midnight, and it was 2am when she drove by. According to the woman, her information had been communicated to the daughter of the secretary of the public safety commissioner, who believed it would be forwarded to the police if it was critical. However, the police never received the information, and the woman did not contact them until months later when she asked for any information related to the murder. The police considered charging the commissioner with failing to pass along the information, but no charges were brought against him. During the year following the homicide, police interviewed hundreds of people, including up to 30 people under hypnosis. The police offered a $10,000 reward for information leading them to the perpetrator as the investigation dwindled. On June 19, 1980, a composite sketch of a man believed to have murdered Michelle was released, based on descriptions provided under hypnosis by two witnesses. Over 80 potential suspects were identified by detectives during the original investigation. More than 60 of these suspects were tested and cleared. A new piece of forensic evidence was discovered 27 years after Michelle was murdered, providing the first real breakthrough in the case. Investigators re-examined evidence in 2006 and found DNA from an unknown male on the gear shift of the Buick and the back of Michelle's dress. Police theorised that the killer bled from injuries sustained during the attack, that, as he stabbed repeatedly, his murder weapon became slippery, causing him to accidentally cut himself through his gloves. From these blood samples, police worked closely with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation's crime lab to develop a DNA profile of the suspect. The lab reports state that the DNA recovered was sufficient for the creation of a profile. However, no matches were detected. As time wore on, it was looking less and less likely that Michelle's family would find closure on the murder of their beautiful daughter, Michelle. 
A tip made in 2013 through Lynn County Crime Stoppers led investigators to a credible suspect, perhaps their first since the investigation began. However, the DNA of the suspect did not match that of the crime scene. In May of 2017, investigators contacted Parabon Nanolabs, a Virginia-based company that provides DNA phenotyping services to law enforcement organizations. Using only genetic information derived from DNA, Parabon can predict an organism's phenotype, including physical features and geographic origins. Parabon created photorealistic illustrations of Michelle's killer using the DNA profile from 2006, a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes, quite different from the 1980s sketch composite. The company provided images estimating the man's appearance in 1979 and in 2017 when wrinkles and a receding hairline would likely have developed. Brandy Jennings was a woman living in Vancouver who wanted to learn more about her family, specifically her father's side. Her dad died in 2009 and her parents divorced when she was just four and a half. They moved out of state and grew up not knowing her dad. Brandy uploaded her DNA to the genealogy website GEDmatch. The DNA she submitted to the genealogy website particularly matched the suspected killer's DNA that investigators had uploaded to the same site. The partial match gave detectives the evidence they needed to zero on on Jerry Burns, a distant relative of Brandy Jennings. Researchers were able to construct a family tree with four sets of Brandy's great-grandparents at the top. The suspect was almost certainly a descendant of one of these four sets of grandparents. Investigators were confident that if they were able to obtain oral swabs from the living descendants of each set of grandparents, they could identify which family the suspect belongs to. Investigator Matt Denlinger located a woman named Janice Burns. He conducted an interview with her and obtained her DNA. Soon after the results were released, it was discovered that she was a suspect's first cousin. This narrowed the suspect pool down to three brothers, Donald Burns, Kenneth Burns and Jerry Burns. Investigators surveilled them, covertly collecting each of their DNA. On October 29, 2018, Matt Denlinger observed the 64-year-old Jerry Burns drink several sodas using a clear plastic straw. Matt collected it after Jerry Burns left it behind for disposal. Kenneth and Donald were eliminated as suspects. However, they couldn't eliminate Jerry. Explain what happened next then as you were sitting in the Pizza Ranch restaurant with... Uh, investigators Freeberg and J.D. Smith. Uh, investigator Freeberg and I sat uh, on one side of our booth so that we could see them at the next booth over. Um, one of the things that we were looking for ideally was a straw. Um, it was going to be easy to collect and we knew it would likely have DNA on it since it had been in their mouth. Um, we noticed that um, Jerry Burns was drinking out of a plastic gl glass and it had a clear straw in it and his son's glass didn't have a straw in it at all so it was kind of easy to keep track of and so we just he got a couple drinks throughout his meal we, we ate too um, and then uh, as soon as they were done eating they exited the restaurant and were back in their car uh, at that time I walked over to the table and, and took the glass back to our table and uh, Freeberg had put some gloves on and he collected the straw, packaged it right into a bag, and we took it back to the police department. Do you recall um, observing Mr. Burns, uh, the defendant in this case, uh, in initially accessing the straw and how he did that? No, um, just from my own um, experience with it. Um, I don't recall exactly how he, how he accessed the straw. I think it was one of those, you push one and one straw comes out uh, things, if I recall. You didn't take it out of a paper? Yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble remembering that at this point, but um, I, I don't recall exactly. After you observed uh, Mr. Burns using the straw, uh, you testified that you then were able to, um, to access that straw? Repeat that, please. Yeah, after you observed Mr. Burns use a the straw, then you were able to collect that straw? Yes, correct. Okay. And uh, after that straw was collected and handed over to Investigator Freeberg and Package, what did you do with it next? Uh, we took it back to the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Uh, we checked it into evidence, uh, and then it was um, checked out by Investigator uh, or ID Officer Kruger and taken to the um, DCI lab in Ankeny. On December 19, 2018, investigators Matt Denlinger and J.D. Smith interviewed their suspect at his business in Manchester, Iowa. 
Jerry Burns refused to voluntarily provide an oral swab, but was obliged to comply when a search warrant was served. Police took photographs of the perpetrator's hands and arms, assuming he would have scars from the attack. Yeah, and as a result of this investigation was that uh, straw then um, sent to the DCI lab in Ankeny for testing? Yes. And when the results were received from the DNA analysis and profiling that took place of the straw taken from um, the beverage that you observed Jerry Burns drinking at the Pizza Ranch on October 29th of 2018, what plans were made next? Uh, well, we decided we needed a couple search warrants. Um, one of them was going to be to collect directly from Jerry's mouth. Um, so I drafted a search warrant for that. And then one of the other theories in the case is uh, that he had cut himself while he was killing Michelle Martinko. So I wrote a search warrant for to look at medical records from the regional medical center in Manchester um, right around the time of her uh, death, uh, you know, hoping to find some records that maybe he got treated for a cut or injury. The interview between the officers and Jerry lasted over an hour and Jerry made and accepted calls and texts throughout, even after being informed of what case they were working on. Jerry claimed that he did not remember committing the crime. The police asked whether he could explain how his DNA ended up at the crime scene. He said he could not. Jerry showed almost no emotion during the interview, even when he was eventually told he was being arrested. The video you're about to watch is the interview between Matt and Jerry. Jerry, my name's Matt. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, I'm with the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Oh, yeah. This is JD. Hi. Uh, he, Hi. He's with me. Hey, can we chat with you for a second about sure. a case we're working on? Sure. We got a cat here, huh? Yep. What's the kitty's name? Bella. Bella. Oh, she's nice. Is she a farm cat? Yep. Can I pull up this other chair with that? Sure. JD has Coffee, JD. <laughs> uh, um, we uh, we work in the cold case unit mm -hmm. down at the Cedar Rapids Police Department, and uh, we're following up on an old case. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard it in the news at all. It's a homicide that happened at Westdale Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Martenko, is that something you've ever heard of? Yeah. Okay. Did you see it in the paper or anything like that? No. How, long time ago. Long time ago. I get a business card, by the way. Boy, I should probably give you one here. Well, what we've been doing lately, and in here. what we've been doing lately is we've been following up on leads, mm -hmm. and we got uh, we had an article run in the paper the other day, and so we just got a bunch of new leads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. People calling in, giving us tips and whatnot, and so we've been stopping by and just chatting with people and. And, and trying to kind of determine, you know, which leads are good and which leads are not and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Well, long story short, your name came up. Hmm. Right. Strange. Yeah. Well, it's not that uncommon. I mean, people call in all the time. We had a picture made mm -hmm. from uh, our suspect's DNA. And then so what people do is they often think that, uh, you know, certain people maybe look like the image and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's kind of how we, we come about that. Did you ever mm -hmm. see those pictures we no. had? Here. So they're like, like those kind of things there. That's not it, though. Well, that's that's the picture oh. we had created. Oh, really? Yeah. And then there's a couple Ooh. other ones, like younger ones and things like that. Wow. It's kind of. Hmm. Well, it looks a lot different than I look in the mirror, but. What's that? It looks a lot different than I look in the mirror, but... Oh, I don't totally disagree with you. <laughs> um, it'd be all right if we just asked you a few questions sure. about it. Mm -hmm. um, so this happened in December of 1979, mm -hmm. and you said earlier that you kind of heard about it. What do, what do you remember hearing about it? Just it was a big deal. A big deal. I mean, do you remember what happened? Not exactly. Like, do you remember who, who the victim was, anything like that? Not really, but... Um, had you no, ever... I just seen something about Jody Hoosentrude recently. And, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a that mm -hmm. yeah, that's a similar kind of thing or whatever mm -hmm. with the girl. But had you ever um, heard of Michelle Martinko before that no. this case came out? Um, no. Had you ever seen her picture in the paper or anything like that? A long time ago. This is this is a, a picture of uh, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Is that anyone you ever remember seeing or anything like that? No. Is not not that's not a name you knew or anything no. like that. Okay. Are you from here originally? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you uh, give me your first name again? Jerry. Jerry. That's right. And what's your middle name, Jerry? Lynn. Yeah. And Burns, right? Yeah. Hmm. Boy, that's strange, those pictures. I know. Do I look like that? Well, I kind of think you, you do a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we Enough that we bothered to come up here and talk. Now, some mm -hmm. people call in and we, we find like driver's license photos or, or old yearbook photos and stuff and kind of mm -hmm. compare them and then we sort of make some sort of educated guess on whether or not mm -hmm. we think it's worth our time. Um, and a lot of times we just err on the side of caution and mm -hmm. we just, you know, let's just go chat with them. What are mm -hmm. we out? We, we get a day day on the road to go chat with someone. Yeah. No big deal. Um, what's your date of birth, Jerry? 12-23-53. Do you have a phone number? Sorry. 319-360-8190. And where in, where'd you go to high school? West Delaware. Did you go to college at all? No. Cat's friendly. That's all right. I got a cat on myself. Um, have you always lived in Manchester? Yeah. You, did you ever live in Cedar Rapids? No. So, I know it's a long time ago. Can you think back? Do you remember ever working in Cedar Rapids? No. Never worked in Cedar Rapids? What did you do for a living in 1979? I was a uh, salesman. I worked in Old Cater. What did you sell? Do you remember? John Deere. Like kind of like if you got out in a lot, those like mowers well, and stuff or big tractors, <clears throat> combines, tractors, everything. Oh sure. So in '79, did you ever have reason to be in Cedar Rapids or anything like that? Not really. So. Did you go to Westdale Mall? Oh yeah, we've gone to Westdale Mall. Sure. Uh, how about what kind of car did you have back then? Do you um, remember? Um, 1979. 74 Chevy Malibu. Do you remember what color it was or anything? Brown. Brown. With a white top. So in those, are, those are the only pictures you had. Those, those three. Yeah. Oh. I mean that's that they just so they make one picture. Mm -hmm. The 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 I'll show it to you in here. So what they do mm -hmm. is they take take your bad guy's DNA, and then they make this 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 young picture. So this is the bad guy at mm -hmm. 25, or it's kind of an yeah. estimation. Yeah. And then the picture with the longer hair is, is the same um, image, only um, it is with like shaggy hair. We had him put like a kind of a 70s hairstyle on it. Oh. Now I didn't know you in 1979. How old were you? Can you do the math real quick? <laughs> 26. Uh, 26. So you know. No. 27, 26, somewhere. You'd know better than we would if you looked like that in 79. Well, I don't think I ever looked like that. 
<laughs> that was a good looking guy if I did. Right, right. Well, you probably were. Um, so, you never worked out at Westdale or anything like no. that? Um, never did any jobs there? No. Um, you never remember seeing her? You don't know her? You weren't there? Um, I'm trying to think. So, the mall just opened in October, like October 12th or something along that night mm -hmm. line. So, it had been open for like two, two and a half months, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so what they did is, so she she uh, was murdered uh, out in the parking lot there. And mm -hmm. so they followed up on it for almost 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And so they've been just, you know, following up on, on people. And then more recently, we uh, had some of the evidence processed and we found some DNA. Mm -hmm. And so from that, we've kind of been reaching out to all these people that are in the reports and just kind mm -hmm. of comparing them to see if we can find a match. And just so far, we just have not found anyone in those reports that we matched mm -hmm. with. So that's when we had the picture made, hoping to get mm -hmm. you know more people to call in. And so people have been calling in. We've taken probably 100, 125, 130 more phone calls mm -hmm. of people, and we're knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were west of when you know when you would have gone out there for just you know, Christmas shopping or you know different times of the years. Christmas. Sure. Did you ever go Those there? Kind of, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, did you ever go there by yourself, without, like no. without your family? Not that I know of. Okay. With that uh, that picture, do you, do you have any brothers that look like you or? Yeah, closer than that. Well, I don't ever remember them looking like that either. <laughs> okay, you have some brothers then. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have two. Two? They mm -hmm. live here too. One does, and one's in Davenport. Okay. But back in seventy, you said seventy nine. Mm -hmm. Yep. One brother was probably. Probably either lived in Ottawa or in Minnesota. Mm, okay. And the other one here? Yeah. Okay. They don't look any more like that then? No. Okay. Were, were you married back then? Yeah. Do you remember hearing, one thing we like to ask people is, do you ever remember hearing rumors or, or stories about what happened to her? Or, really. or who might have done it or anything like that. I know you're a little further away from the case than mm -hmm. some of the people that like knew her specifically, but you don't ever remember hearing any rumors or, or how she died? You ever Not remember really. hearing how she died? So we're going to collect it today. And uh, send it to lab. There's your copy of the search warrant. Never seen one of these before. Yeah, it's. I got some I got some gloves here office. All it is is a little cheat tip. I just collect it from inside the mouth. It's not, uh... <clears throat> this takes a few days yeah, at the yeah, at the lab and we'll okay. And I just need to collect a little from the other side. We'll contact you afterwards, let you okay. know the results. And okay. I'm just thinking. Gosh. I'm just spitballing here. But. Oh, hold on. It's probably my wife here. Yep, that's my wife. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, we, 
we kind of know going in that this is probably going to be a match. Oh, really? Yeah. Why would that be? Well, we were kind of hoping you'd tell us. The reality is, oh my gosh, what does she need? The reality is we're not, we're not here on a whim. Hmm. We're here to confirm what we already know. I already collected some DNA from you that you got rid of before. And so uh, I'm telling you, Jerry, I already know that your DNA is going to match the, the DNA hmm. that we have on file. Just one there that I got rid of. Well, you, people get rid of stuff all the time. And just throw it away. But I, I think that's kind of irrelevant mm -hmm. to, to what we're talking about here. Jerry, so the reality is we have your DNA at the crime scene. And so we know you were there that night this happened. Uh, but what we don't know, Jerry, is why it happened. Now, there's a lot of reasons things happen in life. And and uh, there might be an explanation for this that would help us better understand what mm -hmm. happened. That, that would not make this you know, a, a terrible thing for you, but I, I don't know what that explanation would be if I don't hear it from you. Well, I don't know. How, how would we get your DNA at the crime scene there, Jerry? I don't know. Test it, see if it is. No, 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 we did. Hmm. How would it be there, Jerry? I don't okay. know. What happened that night? Wait for the test to come back. Jerry, we... I don't think it did. It did? I don't uh, think so. Okay. Jerry, what happened that night? I don't know. Test it and see what happens. Yeah, I don't... We're going to test this. Okay. okay. Go ahead and test it. We are. But what I'm telling you is that I'd already collected some DNA from stuff you discarded, and it matched our sample from the crime scene, Jerry. Let's let's just... Can we back up for a second? Would that be all right? And, and, and can I ask you a little bit about the crime itself, and we can just forget about the straw for a minute? Okay. Okay. And like I said, if you got to get back to work, let me know. Um, the crime scene's pretty limited, okay? It's not, you know, like all over the town. It's just in one little spot out mm -hmm. of Westdale Mall in her car. Um, is it possible that you're out at Westdale Mall and you run into some, some girl that you feel like talking to or maybe you, you knew casually? Mm -hmm and that you were just having a conversation with her? Mm -hmm. That's not possible. If at any point is it possible that you just you ran into her and said hi to her by the, you know? No, no that's not possible. No. It's n there's no conceivable way you would have ever just, you know, sat down next to her at the Orange Julius no. and said hi? No. Okay, because that's never, because that kind of thing has never happened before or what? Not really. Okay. Hey, you ever accidentally get in the wrong car out at Westdale Mall? No. Okay. You ever accidentally, you know, run run into a, a young girl out there and, and no. say hi to her or anything like that? No. You ever say hi to any young girls out there that weren't your wife? No. Okay. I mean, I understand your concerns about putting yourself there, but I mean... The reality is, though, we kind of know you were there, and I, I mean, we're past kind of no. We know you were there, but the why part is what we're not positive on. No, we better prove I was there first. Well, I don't think that's a problem. Okay. Okay. I think the, dropping anyone off. No. Nope. Doing? Do you ever bank there? No. Um. Did. Did you ever shop at J.C. Penney's there? No. No. Not unless we were Christmas shopping. Right. And all or the shopping. All the shopping you ever did there was with your wife mm -hmm. or yeah. your family or something. Excuse me. Uh, go to a movie. No. Never went to a movie out there. Well, there was we a... did, but with the family. Right. Do you ever have any any uh, mental episodes in your life or anything like that where mm. you can't remember? I don't know. 
You don't know if you've ever had any. Have you ever taken yeah. any medication for that kind of stuff? No, not not exactly. I might have. Um, no. Can't think of the word where you hit your head. Concussion. 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 Yeah. yeah. Playing sports or working or what? Working. Oh sure. Yeah, you ever seriously injure yourself other than that? Not really. Um, and when was the concussion? No, several. Before. Nothing medic. I mean, I've never went to the doctor for one, but I've been knocked out. So. Mm. You remember when that would have been? Mm, probably three or four different times. Yeah. Falling, banging my head, and that kind of stuff. Were you an adult or? Yeah. Okay. Did you ever go to Cedar Rapids, like go out to the bars there, and go visit your buddies? Not really. I didn't really have any friends that drank much. So. Okay. So when you say not really, did you ever go to any of the bars in Cedar Rapids? Not, not that I can think of. Or at that time in your life at least? Mm -hmm. Not not at all? Not really a bar person. Did you ever have any substance abuse problems yourself? No. Okay. No, no drugs, no, no alcoholism or no. anything like that? Well... I drank a fair amount when I was younger, but... Sure. Do you think that may, that may have contributed to what happened that night? I don't think anything happened that night. Do you, do you remember hearing about it in 1979? Oh, yeah. It was a big story. Right. What do you remember? Or do you remember where you were when you first heard about it? Not really. Okay. Just on the news. Just on the news? And you don't know how she died, mm -hmm. right? Not specifically. Well, what do you think happened to her? I don't know if she was attacked or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, do you know where? Not at Westdale Mall, yeah. And just stuff you've heard in the news? Mm -hmm. Nothing firsthand? Right. Any reason anyone would uh, would have written down your plate, your license plate, that particular night? No, I night? wasn't there. Yeah, well, I think we've already established that you were there. I don't think so. We just haven't. Do you know what today is? 19th of December. Did you murder someone that night, Jerry? Test the DNA. Jerry. Test the DNA. Why did this happen, Jerry? Test what, the DNA. What happened? I don't know. I you was don't, not there that night. You don't know why this happened? I was not there that night. Well, we know better than that, Jerry. You know better than that. You know I'm not lying. Okay. I don't know. You, you don't do know, what, know, Jerry. I don't know you, what games play. You know for a fact I'm not lying about that. Okay. You know for a fact that I'm not lying about that. Okay, that's the one thing we all know. We don't know that. We do. Well, I don't assume you're lying. You don't assume. You I believe. Am. You believe. You believe what you believe. Well, that I appreciate you giving me that. Um, what I don't believe is that you don't remember being there that night. And I, I'm, I'm starting to feel like your your reluctance to to explain why you were there. If I was there, I don't know. As far as I know, I was not there. If you were there, you don't know what you were doing there? I don't know. I don't have a recollection of being there. Okay. Well, is it possible you were you were there shopping by yourself and someone wrote your plate down for some other reason? I don't believe I mean, I know that's something you previously said no, but if you really thought hard about that. What was the plate number? What's that? What plate number do you have? Oh, I don't even have any of any my paperwork with me. I just brought that picture to show you. Hmm. I don't believe it. What? If there was a plate number, why would it take that many years? Take a good look at her picture for me, mm -hmm. please. And just really make sure in your mind that this is not someone you know. I don't believe or that so. You met. 
This is not a girl you ran into at a bar that no. night. No. Um, it's not someone that, that... I don't go to bars, really. Did you ever talk to... Well, okay. I'll give you that. I don't go to bars that much myself. <coughs> but, you know, I can envision someone coming down from Manchester from uh, or from Manchester and just stopping out at the new mall, checking it out. Um, you know, maybe there was a bar in the mall, maybe going to the bar in the mall, maybe running into girls that work there. Um, and I'm not, I'm not judging you if you're trying to, you know, talk to girls or whatever at that time in your life. I, you were young. I, although you claim this picture made you good look, and I think you probably were back in the day. Not like okay. that, but. What's that? Not like that. But not like that? Well. Can I make this call quick? Sure can. It's my brother. Oh, okay. Good. The crime lab examined Jerry's oral swab. They found his DNA matched the blood sample on Michelle's dress. According to court documents, the probability of finding Jerry Byrne's DNA profile among unrelated individuals is less than 1 in 100 billion. Jerry Burns was arrested on December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years after Michelle Martinko's death. He pleaded not guilty and said he could not offer a plausible explanation for why his DNA was found at the crime scene. No, they did not. Okay, gotcha. Well, you got a lot of cars. They're going to have to use a phone call. Hey, I know I didn't say it before because before we hadn't really decided whether or not, uh, you know, what we were doing with the situation, but, you you know, you're clearly in custody now. Okay, so I'm going to advise you of your rights, okay? You okay. have the right to remain silent. Hey, Judy, this is Boyer. How are you? I'll let him finish real quick here. Hey, Judy, real quick. Oh, no, um, I need to just document some mileage here. I'm going to be 1095 um, no, not from an address here in uh, Manchester. This is 1608-230th Street, and my miles are zero. I'll be en route to the station with an uh, adult man. Yeah, 1608, yep. Yeah. All right, thanks, Judy. Bye. All right, we were shoving off. Hey, Judy, so I got your cell phone and your your billfold and your key up here, so. Okay. Matt, if we're good to go, I'll shut yes. off then. Yep, let's, All let's right. head back to the office there. Sounds good. It's right off the card. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to an attorney. They have an attorney present during questioning. He stood trial at Scott County District Court. State prosecutor called Michael Allison, a former cellmate of Jerry Burns in his murder trial. Do you know the defendant in this case, Jerry uh, Lynn Burns? Yes, I do. And how do you know him? I know him from living in the same unit with him. 
Did you get to know uh, Mr. Burns from being um, in the Lynn County Jail with him? Yes, I did. Jerry and I probably spoke to each other more than we spoke to anybody else in the unit. When do you think you began speaking with Mr. Burns? Probably about two weeks after I got there. We're both kind of quiet as far as that goes, and we ended up becoming close after that. He claims to have had. You may ask your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. So in regards to this conversation about regrets, Mr. Burns indicated to you that um, he wished he would have cleaned up after himself? Is that yes, sir. With respect to the um, time period of Mr. Burns' offense and on the same comment that he made, did uh, Mr. Burns ever indicate anything to you about uh, circumstances of um, the crime back in the day and his thoughts about it? Yeah, that was in the same conversation, actually, and uh, he said at that time, I think it was 79, he said, or in that area that no one was thinking about a, a DNA as far as it being a possibility. <laughs> Did you ever ask the defendant directly if he committed the crime with, 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 with with which he's charged? Yes, I did. I asked him directly if I asked him, Jerry, did you do it? Do the crime? And he said, I can't talk about this. Did he ever suggest to you during your conversations with him that he didn't do it? No, never. You mentioned that you and the defendant would frequently play, um, that Mr. Burns that would play pinochle together. Do you recall uh, a time, and um, this would be approximately within the last month or since the beginning of the year or so, when you were playing uh, pinochle with Mr. Burns and you kept beating him? Yeah, um, I remember that well because um, he had told me if I keep beating him in pinochle, he was going to have to take me to the mall. Mr. Allison, have you heard um, Mr. Burns make that comment to other people or in your presence? No, sir. As I listened to Michael Allison's testimony, there were two instances that I did not believe to be coincidental and instead a chilling but subtle reference to Michelle Martinko's murder. The first instance was when Jerry Burns discussed DNA. This was in relation to a lack of advancements and technology in DNA testing, suggesting Jerry Burns was reasonably confident he wouldn't need to worry about his DNA at the crime scene. We all know that the case was left unsolved for decades due to a lack of DNA evidence. So up until his arrest, 39 years later, he was correct. The second instance occurred when Jerry offered to take Michael to the moor if he continued to win a game of pea knuckle they played together. What did he mean by, take him to the moor? Was this a reference to Cedar Rapids, where Michelle Martinko was murdered? Again, just my opinion, but I think Jerry was playing mind games with Michael and teasing him with information only he knew about regarding Michelle's murder. If you're still not convinced, please listen to this next segment. ...with you, uh, his feelings regarding the um, potential outcome of his trial or something he told, you, told to you about no matter what happens, what his feelings would be? Yeah, he feels like... Uh no matter what happens in this case, that he, he wins because he had the, had the opportunity to be out there with his family all these years. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Jerry Burns almost seemed to realize his fate was sealed and very much appreciative of the years he spent living as a free man, as if somehow he managed to elude the system and get away with it for as long as he did. Jerry Burns was found guilty by the jury of first-degree murder on Monday, February 24, 2020. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of 18-year-old Michelle Martinko in December of 1979. Mr. Burns, we have reached the stage in this sentencing hearing where, pursuant to the rules of criminal procedure, you have the right to address me uh, with any facts or circumstances you think are important and that I should consider before I enter judgment and sentence you today. Uh, this isn't to put you on the spot or make you nervous. Uh, but pursuant to the rules, if you have anything to say, sir, this is your opportunity to speak. Thank you, Your Honor.
First of all, I'd like to say that somebody else stabbed Michelle to death in that car that night. I don't know who, I don't know why. But I would like to thank my family and friends for their support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Burns. It's my understanding uh, that um, Michelle Martinko's sister and brother-in-law have prepared a statement uh, that they would like me to hear. Is that correct, Mr. Maybanks? It is, Your Honor, and we have a, a video statement of that. It's going to be uh, broadcast here on this TV. My name is John Stonebreaker. I'm Janelle Martinko Stonebreaker's husband. Our family spent 39 Christmases under a shadow without answers, a shadow that never left. 39 Christmases. The court can well imagine the shock, anguish, and horror we felt on learning of Michelle's awful death. I'll never forget Michelle's mother, Janet, calling in the early morning hours of December 20th, 1979. She wasn't crying so much as gasping, choking. She could hardly speak. That night she had identified the body of her bloody, torn, broken daughter, her beautiful daughter, her miracle baby born to her at age 44. She faced with strength the terrible tasks of first identifying Michelle's mutilated body and then calling us in Davenport, but with the most grief-stricken anguish I had ever heard or ever expect to hear. I don't remember much of that day now. What I remember most are the 39 Christmases with our little family, diminished by one, and everyone's brave efforts to be merry and normal, mostly for our boys, Michelle's nephews, year after year. And that year, 1979, Michelle's presents were unopened. Families experience the sudden loss of a loved one every day. Car accidents, heart attacks, a hundred other things shattered, normalized in an instant. We understand that, and to that extent, we're no different. What is an order of magnitude worse is the viciousness with which Michelle was taken and the terrible questions that were never far from our minds, the who and the why. How could anyone hate so much? Someone who did not even know his victim. For us, the answer lies not in hatred. The post-arrest investigation provides the answer. For us now, the answer lies in a deeply selfish, lifelong, personal need. A need Mr. Burns kept hidden all his adult life until now. As time passed without an arrest, Janet Martinko became bitter and withdrawn, and pretty much stayed that way. She directed her anger at an old boyfriend of Michelle's whose DNA proved him innocent. But his innocence seemed to trouble her and confuse her even more. Al, Michelle's father, was more stoic. He suffered more privately. One of his co-workers at Smulikoff's department store said that Al would sometimes just sit at his bench where he repaired watches and silently weep Before Michelle's death, I'd ask, how do you do now? He'd always answer, mighty fine, mighty fine. I don't remember him saying that afterwards. This court as an instrument of the law will soon punish Mr. Burns for taking Michelle's life. 
but the law cannot punish him for the damage done to her family and loved ones. The law cannot punish him for the terrible shock, shame, pain, and devastation in the innocent lives of the killer's own family and his loved ones. As we have done, they will pick up the pieces of their lives, mend them, and go on. We are sad for them. We reach out to them in their sorrow and ours, and wish them well. We deeply regret that Michelle's dad and mom aren't here to know what their surviving daughter knows. That is Mr. Burns who took Michelle's life and will forfeit his freedom forever. It helps to know that his world will be a sad little cell and that Mr. Burns will never again smell the rich, freshly plowed earth of Delaware County or the new moon hay in the summer. The sights, sounds, and aromas of his world will be very different. Many inmates put a calendar on their wall. They literally mark time putting an X through each day that passes. Because they have a goal, freedom. And as their goal gets closer every day, they, their hope develops. Their satisfaction in making that X every day, optimism, hope, a future. But Mr. Burns won't do that. He has no hope. He will die alone. Mr. Burns will be given pain medication if he needs it in a humane gesture to ease his transition from light to darkness. Mr. Burns may receive a sedative to calm him for what lies ahead. His mark on the world and the sum of his life will be a short notice saying, convicted murderer dies in prison. Convicted Martinko murderer dies in prison. Of course, Michelle got no pain medication. She received no sedation to dull the terrible horror, confusion, pain, and panic of what was happening. Just six days before Christmas, she died alone. Instead of a loving family at her face, at her, at her side, the last face she saw was Jerry Lynn Burns, and it tears our heart out. Judge Hoover, Janelle and I are thankful in another way. We are thankful that she fought so hard. Michelle played a critical role in identifying her own killer. The defensive wounds on her hands show it. She fought so hard that she was able to deflect the killer's knife so that he stabbed himself, leaving the blood that caught him. In a very real way, Michelle became her own best witness. Still, Mr. Jerry Burns was clever enough to steal 39 years of freedom he didn't deserve. And he knows it. And without a hint of shame, he said as much. And in another sense, in the most selfish act a human being is capable of, he stole those 39 years and many more from a sweet, smart, talented girl who never got her chance at college, a career, marriage, children, and by now even grandchildren. While Mr. Burns has been living free without the conscience of a real man, what remains of Michelle rests with Janet and Al Martinko in Cedar Memorial. Your Honor, thanks to the humanity, wisdom, and mercy of the people of Iowa, Mr. Burns cannot be put to death for what he did. We are at peace with that. He receives a grant of mercy from the faceless state of Iowa that Michelle did not. But he will die a little bit every day, and in his long nights to come. And there is some justice in that. Mr. Burns went to Westdale Mall to kill, armed with a knife and rubber gloves that he was sure would protect his identity. He picked Michelle out of the crowd of Christmas shoppers that night, stalked her, and killed her. Janelle and I are comforted, and we can all be comforted, by the fact that if it wasn't Michelle that night, it would have been some other young woman and that young woman is surely alive today 
well into late middle age because Michelle is not. It angered us beyond measure to learn that Mr. Burns listed among his regrets that he did not clean up after himself after the murder. He did not regret his act of killing another human being. No. He regretted not doing a better job. And his comment to his cellmate that he thought was so clever, threatening to, quote, take him to the mall if he won again at Pinnacle. Beyond hurtful, of course, but in that way he described himself graphically as among the most odious of human beings. We are forever grateful to the people of Cedar Rapids for keeping hope alive for 39 years, to Cedar Rapids law enforcement for their professionalism and endless resolve to see this case through to a resolution, to the Lynn County prosecution team for their effective work and to the support staff they provided to us. Over these many years, Cedar Rapids has never been far from our thoughts. And it has been a constant comfort to us that Michelle has meant so much to so many. Finally, Your Honor, Mr. Burns will soon board a state van and be removed from civilized society, excised from all of us like an oozing wound. We are cleansed by his absence, and the remaining members of Michelle's family and loved ones are healed by the knowledge that he will never walk free again. Thank you. Jerry's lawyer filed a motion for a new trial based on new evidence. However, the judge denied the motion. Michelle's family were overcome with grief from losing their youngest daughter. Michelle's parents Jeanette and Albert Martinko never recovered from her death. Before the murder, Jeanette Martinko had been a lively, outgoing individual. However, afterwards she would not wish to be seen publicly. This included even going to the supermarket. The Martinkos plunged into painful seclusion and were plagued by health problems until their deaths. Albert passed away in 1995 and Jeanette in 1998. Her family continued to express how sad they were because their daughter had passed away and they didn't know who her killer was. No doubt their lives will be forever altered as a result of the tragedy that occurred on that fateful night at Cedar Rapids Moor. However, now they have closure and Christmas is now a little more joyous for the Martinko family.